My name is Elizabeth Braw. I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm also a columnist of foreign policy and political Europe. Uh, but I'm not the most interesting person uh, here on this stage because I have two phenomenal guests with me. And one who arrived last night and is still looking chipper, uh, John Healy, the UK Shadow Defence Secretary, who's a very uh, busy man and has been a busy man at the very least since 1997, John, when you were first elected to the UK Parliament as part of the uh, wave of new Labour MPs uh, that were elected when Tony Blair uh, came to power. And John has uh, been a member of Parliament ever since. I, that is an incredible achievement, putting yourself to the voters so many times and getting their seal of approval so many times. Um, and he has also served in a number of ministerial positions. And this is uh, really a sign of, of how versatile UK politicians are. Uh, a Minister of Housing and Planning, Education, Treasury, um, and then uh, also in the Cabinet under Gordon Brown. And now he is um, a Shadow Defence Secretary in Keir Starmer's Shadow Cabinet. He's also the longest serving member of Keir Starmer's Shadow Cabinet. Um, and uh, he has, in fact, been in every Shadow Cabinet uh, since 2010, when um, uh, shortly after the Conservatives came back to, to power. Dean Phillips uh, hasn't been... Uh, it's going to be a shorter... <laughs> Actually not, because you have had a, a really fascinating career as a businessman. Dean, I just read up on one of your early, uh, early business uh, deals, uh, which was when you discovered uh, Polish vodka uh, in the 90s. And I think we all remember, well, those of us above the age of 20-something uh, remember the 90s, when, uh, when there was just enormous commercial activity and Western companies discovering former, uh, well, all kinds of state-owned companies behind the former Iron Curtain. And so, Dean, you brought Belvedere Vodka to the United States. We did. Um, so and we, uh, the Congress could use a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dean then went on to uh, lead his his um, family's uh, company, well, actually uh, had already joined it, Philips Distilling, and then went on to found uh, Talenti Gelato. Uh, how many of you have Talenti in your freezer? I, I do. And, and Dean, I, you sold it then uh, subsequently to uh, Unilever in 2014, and I think of that as peak globalization. Yeah. In 2014, exactly. premium gelato was the thing, and uh, Unilever, that, that, that was sort of what, what Unilever thought about and what they focused on. Now yeah. they focus on how do we leave Russia? And, and so, uh, and you yourself, Dean, has, uh, you have since joined the US Congress, uh, a sign of, of how times are shifting and you're focusing a lot on national security. Um, and in fact, national security is on everybody's minds. Uh, not just uh, the minds of business executives, but politicians. And it's, it's such a pleasure to have the two you. Of, of you here. I, I just want to add that Dean is also a member of the DPCC, which means that he's a member of uh, 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 Leader Jeffrey's leadership team, and he's also the ranking member of um, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee's Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia subcommittee. Now, I want to start with you, John, because the reason uh, you are here and, and the reason that we should all be interested in hearing from you is that your party is once again looking very strong, uh, almost as strong as, as it did in 97. And uh, I was just looking at the most recent poll. It gives you 45% of the vote compared to 28% for the Conservatives and 12% for the Liberal Democrats, 6% for the Greens. And that means that you are likely to become the next UK Defence Secretary, unless the Conservatives appoint another one in the meantime. Um, but if after a general election, you are likely to become the next uh, Defence Secretary. And uh, so I was going to say congratulations, but it is a poison challenge <laughs> because uh, the UK armed forces are very stretched. They don't have enough money. And, and yet they have the expectation in the UK and, and abroad, uh, they have the expectation on them that they should be able to fix everything, go everywhere, whether it be the Navy, uh, the Army or the, the Royal Air Force. So what will your priorities, what would your priorities be uh, should you become uh, the next occupant of the Ministry of Defence? after the next election. Elizabeth, thank you. Um, 
what a tremendous introduction to us both, Dean. Um, thank you for that. I hope uh, versatile doesn't mean superficial. Um, and part of the reason for me being here uh, and keen to be at events like this is to hear from uh, some very expert views uh, and people in the room. So thank you for that. Particular thank you to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting us. I feel honoured, I have to say, to be here. Um, I think the AEI can perhaps make the strongest claim to be the mother of US policy institutes and probably the strongest claim to be the first of the US think tanks. And I love the idea that when you were first set up before the Second World War, you were established as a group of 12 thinkers. And certainly in our world, uh, Dean, I think now probably, certainly on the UK side, there's not enough thinking uh, and reflection uh, and in politics. So thank you for having us here, Elizabeth. And I must say, particular pleasure to join you. Um, Elizabeth, before she joined the AEI, was over the UK side at, in our uh, Royal United Services Institute. And uh, I first came across Elizabeth. She invited me to her book launch, Democracy's Defenders. So I said yes. And then I started asking around, well, who's this Elizabeth Braw? And somebody said, you must go to this. This is the mother of current thinkers about resilience and hybrid threats. So uh, Elizabeth, to share a platform with you is, is great. And Dean, thank you for joining oh, us. I must say, I hadn't realised you'd done such a great public service before you entered Congress in bringing Polish <laughs> vodka to, to the US. But one of the reasons I was so keen on this link up is that I admire your work in this field, and in particular, your determination to try and make it bipartisan in a period of politics where certainly in the UK, uh, in recent years, uh, and in the US, things are deeply polarised, and when we consider mess questions of defence and security, there needs to be greater bipartisanship, there needs to be greater long-term uh, and clear-sighted analysis and strategic thinking. And it's been a disappointment to me in the UK, and I will come to your questions in a moment, Elizabeth, um, that in the series of strategic reviews the UK government's undertaken, first the uh, global strategic review, the integrated review and its refresh, and then the defence uh, sister strategy to that, both those, 21 and 23, uh, I made the offer for Labour as the official op opposition to contribute to those because I wanted them to be the uh, national strategy for the country, not just the strategy for the particular set of ministers that happened to be in government at the time. Uh, that wasn't uh, taken up. Um, so I will always look for the sort of strengths in what the government's doing, support them where I can, but I will do my job to challenge them. And clearly in this period running up to a, a, a general election in the UK in 2024, now's the time when also we have to prepare for the point that we may win that and to know what we need to do in government. So, um, Elizabeth, the polls are good. Um, certainly for Labour at present, but um, I tell you, no elected politician ever takes any election for granted, and those that do are pretty soon uh, found out and kicked out. So I've been around long enough uh, and first served under Tony Blair in 1997, and I remember before that election that you mentioned, Elizabeth, he styled himself publicly as the eternal warrior against complacency, and many Many are trying to draw parallels with Keir Starmer, who's a different sort of politician at a different time. But I tell you, in the shadow cabinet and in the Labour Party at the moment, he is the first and hardest to say there's no complacency about the current position. And um, I'm very conscious that we've got a great deal more to do between now and an election. So, um, yes, uh, if we are able to win, uh, if I'm privileged to be asked to do this job in government, then... Uh, Certainly there are some tough challenges and no, under no illusions about that. Um, the threats that our country and yours faces, but ours, uh, the UK faces, are um, intensifying, they're diversifying. We have a full-scale war on the mainland in Europe. And as the last Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, said in the House of Commons to me, um, over the last 13 years, we've hollowed out and underfunded our armed forces. So 
Over those 13 years, um, we've seen 45,000 full-time personnel cut from the forces. That's a third for US colleagues here. That's a third of what we've got left. We've seen one in five of the Navy ships taken out, in, out of service. And the satisfaction levels for those uh, in service, with service life, is at record lows. So huge, huge um, challenges. What would be different about Labour? Well, let me say a couple of things about what would be different, a couple of things about what would not be different. There would be no change under a Labour government to the implacable and long-term support from the UK for Ukraine. Um, support for Ukraine and in confronting Russian aggression. There will be no change under a Labour government, under Keir Starmer, to our view of the US as the single most essential ally to the UK, particularly on defence and security. Um, if you're looking for hallmarks or pointers to change, then I'd, I'd suggest perhaps three or four. Um, we would put NATO first. That means fulfilling in full, meeting our full obligations and commitments to NATO, particularly under the new regional um, plans. Uh, it means ensuring that Britain, question mark remains, it, it, ensuring that Britain is the leading European nation in NATO at a time when the European nations within NATO post-Ukraine have got to take more responsibility for defence and security in the North Atlantic area. Um, so two, 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 um, one, that's the first change. The second would be you would see a Labour-led government rebuilding uh, relationships with, particularly with key European allies. Um, one of the harsh lessons from Ukraine that has reminded us that our strategic strength are our alliances, and we're conscious in the UK of the way that relationships with many European countries and the institutions in Europe have been badly damaged by the Brexit process, often deliberately so during that process. So I, I've been work, leading work on a potential scope for a, uh, a broad UK-Germany defence and security agreement. Um, I'm looking at the scope for rebooting the UK-French Lancaster House um, defence and security agreement. And we are starting to open up early discussions about scope for greater cooperation and potentially a formal pact between the UK and the European Union on defence and security. Um, three, um, it seems to me now that deep defence procurement reform has to be a top priority, not just for uh, defence ministers, but for the defence secretary himself or herself. Um, and Ukraine, again, really has confronted us with a truth that we've been happy to set to one side, which is that when uh, countries are under threat or forced to fight, or in this case, we're forced to support those who are fighting for the same values in Ukraine, then our forces are only as strong as our uh, industry to support them. Uh, and fourth, we have reached a stage, I think, over the last um, decade and a bit where we have, as a country, corroded the nation's moral contract with those who serve and the families who support them while they serve. And so that, too, uh, Elizabeth, if you like, would be a fourth point of change that people could expect to see if we do indeed get a change of government at the next election. Just a, a quick um, follow-up on that, which is that the UK is incredibly ambitious, has been for decades, when it comes to defence, even though it's, it's not a very big country. Uh, it's a G7 country, but with a much smaller economy than uh, countries with com comparable military ambitions. So is it, is it just, does the UK government, whichever party is in power, need to be a bit, on, bit more honest with, with, with the public and say, you know, what, what you expect from the military is just not within within the realm of the possible uh, at 2% defence spending? Or can it be done? Short answer, yes. Slightly longer answer is um, it is one reason for recognising that um, Europe and the North Atlantic and High North area are where the greatest, um, most acute threats to our UK 
um, security and to our close allies in NATO lie. Um, our first priority for defence must therefore be where the threats are greatest, not where the business opportunities may lie. And we saw a period under, I've lost track, um, the last but one British Prime Minister um, just two years ago, um, where the idea of a global Britain was almost a shorthand for anywhere but Europe. Uh, and the bombast around the Indo-Pacific tilt, particularly giving the impression that somehow our military could be deployed in a significant way there, was simply misleading ourselves and misleading the public and potentially misleading allies. So I was really pleased in the uh, reset and the refresh in 2023 under the current Prime Minister, where the, the British government has confirmed that the tilt to the Indo-Pacific has been completed. We will continue that. Realistic about what military deployments uh, and what marginal difference we can make in military terms, but certainly in capability and technology and diplomacy and in industrial cooperation, there are a, a number of things that we can pursue further and will in the Indo-Pacific, but NATO has got to be at the heart of our um, commitments it lies at the heart of our treaty obligations to allies, and that, along with homeland defence, is at the heart of where the threats also now lie, particularly post-Ukraine, with a decade ahead of Russian aggression that um, we, must, we must do more to prepare for. Dean, it, it used to be the case that business was a, a completely different world from, from national security, and now business really is the front line of, of national security. Businesses are the front line soldiers, as it were. And so we are seeing uh, Western companies, not just companies, but indeed Western societies harmed in all, all kinds of ways that, that we are not prepared for. And, and uh, you have worked a lot on this and, and will obviously uh, uh, sympathize, I think, with, with uh, CEOs that have to make incredibly difficult decisions, not having any rule book to... to go by because this is so new. So what, what worries you the most about our viability as, as free and open societies, uh, uh, to operate as free and open societies, even, even though that makes us so vulnerable? So as you, first, uh, thank you everybody, and to AEI, to you Elizabeth, uh, John. Uh, as I listen to you, I, I hear the very same challenges uh, and opportunities that we face. Uh, and we can talk about some of those later. As I, you reference business, and, and I have to say I'm struck as John was articulating what he might do as a defense minister, I'm sorry, defense secretary, and how from the business world, I look at how government applies its various, various agencies and um, positions, and I'm struck by the fact that I think we're very far behind. And as I contemplate defense, it's usually kinetic defense. We're defending against military threats. And it's, an, it's a, and it's an all-in approach, economically, human resources, strategically, and why we're not looking at it more comprehensively and holistically, uh, defense against biological threats, uh, defense against misinformation, uh, the undermining of democracy. Uh, and I think it begs the question about um, whether we look at different models of organizing uh, democratic government uh, to be more comprehensive, to break down silos, more collaborative, and recognize uh, economic defense, by the way, uh, is another extraordinarily important, I think, misunderstood uh, challenge uh, that, that we face. And as I, as I assess uh, enterprise uh, around the world and its role, first of all, no one's going to invest if there is um, uh, a, a threat, uh, if, if the security environment is, is complicating. You look at, I look at Elon Musk yesterday doing a, a Twitter space with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think he met with Erdogan uh, recently as well. You have heads of state increasingly meeting more with heads of business mm -hmm. than fellow heads of state, uh, which is yet another, this notion of nation states and rogue states and malign actors. And then you have now business leaders that are essentially, in many cases, representing as many people as many nations. And uh, to be participants in these discussions as it relates to defense is uh, both a need and, and also an opportunity, uh, and especially, of course, in the developing world. And how we use our foreign aid, how we use our development dollars, uh, they're so closely intertwined with our defense strategies that I think we are missing not just an opportunity, but um, a great need to be more collaborative, uh, and particularly not in 
nation state silos, uh, but with our friends around the world. And since businesses are global, uh, I think we have to find forms, space, and place uh, to have those discussions and be more integrated. I, I just thought of a, uh, a conversation I had last week at London Shipping Week, which is the the, 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 the global shipping conference. Mm -hmm. and, and I was talking in a panel about the, the force that the US, the US has deployed, US Navy and Marine Corps has deployed to the Strait of Hormuz to try to keep order, to keep the Iranians from harassing tankers going through the Strait sure. of Hormuz. And, and the challenges of, of trying to keep order in this globalized economy using military tools when if those Marines and sailors, if they go one step too far, we'll, we'll have a, a war with Iran. And how do we do it? And then somebody from Saudi Aramco stood up and said, well, couldn't there be a, a, a regional alliance of, of countries in the Gulf that would put together this force? And that sort of, uh, I think, symbolizes the challenges. We don't, even, we, we don't even know who is supposed to keep order in this world, let alone with what tools. So uh, maybe, John, if I can put that to you first. Um, uh, how do we how do we steer a course in this just totally uh, uh, intermingled uh, uh, reality of various threats that are not exclusively military but are but are real enough and where there is not it, where there is not clear where it's not clear mm -hmm. who should be in charge or or what they should do. Uh, no simple formula is there um, for me. NATO is the cornerstone of our security in, um, in the Western world. Uh, that remains. Uh, the United Nations meeting this week, I hope, is going to prove itself up to the challenge of some of the areas that they're discussing and trying to reach agreement on. But there's been a, um, a paralysis of the United Nations for in recent years. So I think the more flexible use of some of the forums that are available has got to be... Um, develop further. Um, I think there were some interesting developments from the G20 uh, earlier this month. And where you've got, where you've got um, countries willing to act together in um, that see things similarly, particularly where they can get a degree of local acceptance, then I think we've got to do more than that. So um, I've been the, the, the UK contribution to that sort of um, maritime policing and security role uh, through the Straits of Hormuz, uh, around the Horn of Africa over the last decade, again, has been a, a, an important role that the UK has played, bipartisan support for that. And um, we've, 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 we've got to be ready to, to, to respond in the way that we can. Dean, um, who should do it? Well, you know, I'm struck, actually I've been reflecting domestically on how communities around this country, the United States, mm -hmm. increasingly are having to take security into their own hands, uh, okay. whether it's retailers uh, with organized crime and uh, smash and grab, uh, where depleted American law enforcement agencies don't have the resources to protect anymore. I think it's analogous to this larger conversation, uh, yeah. especially amongst, amongst democratic um, you know, countries in which uh, we find it slow, we, we're slower to act, uh, uh, we, our, our, our power is more diffuse, and it begs that question, and I think you're seeing corporations around the world having to develop their own strategies uh, and um, resource them themselves, and I, I, so your question is an interesting one, and I think it has analogies very close to home, uh, very local, if you will, uh, and international. And I'm also, I reflect on the fact that we have so many forms and groups and organizations and convenings and bodies. How do you consolidate those into more actionable, expeditious uh, forms uh, that have some teeth uh, and that have some power to act? That, you know, the beauty of democracy is the, you know, the, the enjoyment of broad perspective. Uh, it's great Achilles heel, if you ask me, uh, is, uh, is flexibility and speed. And as it relates to security, what do you need more than flexibility and speed? So we're not well suited for it. So I think this question is one more about consolidation, if you will, uh, rather than propagation or expansion. Uh, and, um, and I don't have a singular proposition for it, but I've been reflecting on that. And that's, I think that's one of our great challenges. It's uh, the, the point you make about uh, the, the 
similarities between depleted police forces mm -hmm. and, and depleted de uh, mm -hmm. militaries is, is really uh, extremely relevant. And, and it leaves communities, whether it be local communities or, or indeed the global community, uh, facing very similar questions. And if I could just say you know, one addition, I, having just been in Saudi Arabia and met with Aramco, you know, this is an organization of, I think it's fair to say, substantial resources, <laughs> uh, more substantial than most countries in the entire world. Yeah. So this is no longer a resourcing issue. We have individuals going to outer space. We have wealth that has been aggregated in the hands of individuals that is unlike anything the world has ever seen, uh, and uh, the attendant power uh, that comes with it. So, uh, you know, mark my words, this is not going to be only uh, uh, countries that have to enter this uh, conversation. You're going to see corporations and even individuals start, I think, financing uh, their own security. Um, and have to. That is something we uh, will... I will definitely be watching. I think we'll all have to watch. There are a, a, a number of many very experienced people in, here in the room, so get your questions ready for, for 9.45 so that we can, uh, so that we can include them, uh, because I'm, I'm not the smartest per person in the room. I do have a number of more questions for you, John and Dean, though. And, and, and so, John, uh, Dean outlined... Uh, or, or, described just now the, the plethora of organizations and groupings and, 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 and uh, working arrangements we have. And, and actually, I was going, going to ask you if we need something uh, in addition to what we have, but maybe, maybe we have too much already. But isn't it the case that, that uh, NATO can't be expected to meet uh, all its needs of all its members and that we need something at least within the Euro-Atlantic Alliance and, and indeed uh, within a, a wider, the wider Western friendship group that uh, is not just the geographical West. Isn't it the case that we need something on top of, of NATO, maybe not another alliance, that, that might be too ambitious, but some sort of working um, arrangements with, with friends that can do things that NATO cannot do uh, what do you think? Is, is that what we need? Yes, though, um, using NATO as the, the, the model for a highly institutionalised treaty-based uh, arrangement may not be the best way to get the flexibility and uh, rapidity that Dean's talked about is that's important. Um, so, so for me, if I use the UK as an example, the um, agreement that we have now struck with the US and Australia over nuclear-powered submarines over the potential for developing some um, advanced technologies under a second um, pillar of the AUKUS agreement, uh, a fundamental commitment now, which, as the Australians are uh, realising, isn't something that you sign up to now, but is actually a decades-long uh, national, national commitment. We could do more like that. Um, the link-up that the UK is... Um, designing with Japan and with Italy as the principal partners over a uh, next-generation fighter um, aircraft um, has that potential as well. Dean used a really interesting phrase. He said we need to consolidate um, on what's there and we need more um, perhaps actionable agreements from the forums or groupings or coalitions that uh, are in place. So rather than necessarily inventing new ones, I think the, the, value, the, the value of of the meetings, the discussions, the communication is certainly there in the world of tense diplomacy and in uh, great power tensions. Um, but the question is where you've got the potential of willing countries. Now, within NATO, one of the things that the current UK government in 2015 established in the UK, led by the UK, was the Joint Expeditionary Force um, uh, at the time to two countries that are outside NATO, Sweden and Finland, uh, but essentially the Baltics and the Nordics, um, with the UK playing the framework nation role, um, looking to get a better operational understanding together, exercise and train more together, um, develop their interoperability, essentially a willingness to act below the threshold of any Article 5 um, uh, threats that uh, NATO nations may face, but a willingness, therefore, to, to, to act in that way. Now, I, I, it's, yet, it's, it's yet to become clear to me the potential role of Jeff within the new uh, NATO regional plans 
But that seems to me a, a, an important role for the UK to be playing, an important coalition where you've got um, actionable, flexible um, and potentially important um, capabilities that can provide both um, greater deterrence um, but also play a part in the NATO's new commitment to um, defence by denial and beefing up the defence side in the face of Russian aggression. Dean, on, on a slightly, uh, in a slightly different way, and, and uh, since you mentioned the, the incredible potential of, of companies in a, uh, to do, to do uh, not so good things and indeed to do good things, I, do you think there's potential for, for government collaboration with, with the, the major companies of this world uh, in, in national security? And, and it, it just struck me that, that for example, Google is, is clearly... Uh, in a position to strike back uh, against cyber attacks, but it's not allowed to because it's obviously not a company. It's not. It's a company, not a defence force. Uh, but do you think is there potential to, for governments to work with companies not to deploy them in, in a military sense, but but to shore up national security? Is that what? Abs what? Absolutely. There are such profound opportunities for more public-private cooperation as it relates to security in my own state, Minneapolis or Minnesota, in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, you have the Mall of America with one of the most robust uh, security apparatus uh, apparatus that I've ever seen that actually collaborates closely with, I think, shares and even educates some of our public law enforcement teams. Uh, the Target Corporation, same thing. You know, that's now that's very local, of course, but take that now to global businesses. Cargill in my, in my uh, state as well. You talk about Google. There are companies, enterprises at the front lines of, to me, what are the most dangerous threats uh, that we will face. And, and I think it's worth noting that you know, rogue actors have recognized that when you use kinetic force against the UK, against the United States, all that does is consolidate uh, a population. It consolidates. So what have they learned? You know, 9-11 is a perfect example. It was the last time this country was absolutely unified and dignified in that unity. Uh, and what did it result in? Of course, uh, it, it resulted in, in much more horror. And I think nations have recognized that if you want to provoke us and you want to undermine us, you do it with gray zone attacks. You do it with economic uh, pokes and prods. Uh, uh, you do it with misinformation, disinformation, because you know, to defeat the United States uh, uh, or the United Kingdom in a conventional war is almost impossible, it's fair to say. It's almost impossible. So that means that you have to use these other approaches. And what is more likely to undermine the United States or the UK is, is internal divisions. And, and they're succeeding. They're succeeding. And I would argue democracies are ill-prepared to confront these challenges, whereas the private sector, Google's a perfect example. There are the, the best and brightest minds I wish were populating public offices. Increasingly, uh, that is, it's just the opposite. Uh, and that concerns me. And I do think there's a, not just an opportunity, there's a profound and distinct need uh, to work with uh, some of the most um, high-tech, uh, well-resourced international enterprises uh, in collaboration to, to address these threats. We spend so much money, time, energy, and focus uh, on our defense resourcing, kinetic defense resourcing, and so, I think, under-investing time, energy, and resources in what I consider to be the most profound threats facing the entire world, and that is undermining the very democracies that we represent. And companies have to, have to play a role. And I know they want to. We have to find space and place and mechanisms for them to do so. And I, if I may make a personal observation on, on that note, it is that executives are realizing that they are not just citizens of the world. They do represent themselves and their companies. Mm -hmm. They do represent the country. And, and that sort of idea that, that you can float around as a, as a, a, a citizen of nowhere, that uh, has really is vanishing rapidly, uh, is not least because companies are becoming uh, targets themselves sure. of, of, of various uh, uh, various uh, nefarious activities, uh, from IP theft mm -hmm. to to uh, cyber aggression. Now, uh, you both of you face uh, elections uh, next year, 
uh, you, uh, Dean, as, as every two years, uh, face an election again. And John, uh, we uh, in the UK, there is a general election coming up, uh, date TBD, uh, as, as ever. <laughs> uh, but that, that raises the question again of, of election security, which is part of what you've been focusing so much on. Um, uh, and, and one of the challenges, I think, is that it, it's not just about whether uh, a hostile power tampers with the election sure. uh, through, di uh, through disinformation or, or cyber interference. It's uh, whether a hostile power manages to, to convince enough voters that the election was tampered with or that it wasn't free and fair or that it was somehow... Uh, not valid. Um, and, and John, you have thought a lot about this and, and uh, you have a fantastic paper out uh, this morning, which I was pleased to be uh, the co-author of, and you have outlined uh, a, a path forward for what, how you think the UK and, and the US can address this uh, in, a, in a more organized fashion. And can you just outline what you have in mind uh, because it is a fantastic proposal addressing not just disinformation and election interference. Uh, sure. As Dean's just said, and you've written extensively, Elizabeth, I, I think democracies are really equipped to um, deal with the sort of undermining deliberate interference and influence that's being directed uh, at our societies and our democratic uh, processes. And I think ahead of 2024, when you face US presidential and congressional elections, we face a general election our country should be on high alert. Uh, and so I, my, I, I'm proposing and believe that now's the moment where we've got to start acting together to protect our democracies. I think there's scope for the US and the UK jointly to establish a uh, centre for democratic resilience. Um, I believe this could play a strong role in helping defend our democratic values, the integrity of our electoral systems uh, and our wider societies. I see this um, as something that requires a bipartisan, the sort of approach that you've worked to develop in, um, in, in Congress, Dean. Um, but I see it as absolutely essential to a defence. The, the, the th threats are clearly intensifying, and this isn't just a, um, a view from the sort of political platform, if you like. It's fundamental to the threat assessment that NATO now brings to what we face. Um, and so we've, 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 we've seen this in the 2022 strategic concept. We saw it in the Vilnius uh, 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 um, communique. And, and after all, NATO was established not just for collective security, but has hardwired into its treaties the protection of democracy and individual freedom. And so when... NATO is now saying resilience is uh, an essential basis for credible deterrence and defence, uh, including um, uh, defence of our electoral process and the effective uh, execution of our core tasks. I think we need to take this more seriously. So I'd love to see the UK and the US coming together to establish a, 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 that sort of centre a remit that perhaps goes beyond where some of the other more academic sort of um, uh, centres are already operating. So it, it would um, be the basis of analysing threats, uh, sharing best practice. Crucially, it would advise um, our, our governments, our agencies and our, our, our industry on action that could be taken uh, and developing strategies that could be used um, by our countries to try and uh, protect us better in the future. And I would see this as something that maybe could be, could be usefully started by the UK and the US together, but would be for other NATO nations to opt in from the start. And, 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 and in time, I hope that could be the basis for a NATO-based body mm -hmm. to undertake what, in the, in the bigger argument, I think there is a case now for saying is that um, resilience in its wider sense, not just in its protection of democratic processes and, and, and threats. Um, resilience should be, a, and democratic resilience should be a fourth core task of NATO. Yeah. Um, Agreed. I think it's, I think it's a, a smart proposition. <clears throat> I think it's urgent. Uh, you know, I, I recognize, as all of you do, that with the advent of the internet and social media, 
uh, what is now our, when one would argue, might be the Achilles heel of democracy in that we're so subject to manipulation uh, by rogue actors using a pipeline into every single one of our homes. What we don't talk much about is the fact that it's also the Achilles heel of our adversaries. Their biggest fear is that their population will be able to access the same information that ours populations do. And we are so focused, and we need to, on the defense of our own and how to combat misinformation, which, by the way, by definition, in free and democratic nations is awfully difficult uh, when we confront the most important value that we all share, which is the freedom of speech. But why we don't talk more about using the very same tool at our disposal uh, to do the same. And you know, propaganda is relative. Uh, I'd like to share the truth. There are too many people in our respective countries, around the world, especially our adversaries, that are devoid of any information, uh, particularly the truth, and why we don't find um, occasion and intention uh, to use these tools at our disposal that we invented uh, is, is surprising to me. And again, I, you know, I think there's a, if there's a thread that weaves together uh, my thought line today, it's that we have to reposition democratic government to govern in 21st century, 21st century world. And we are still using, in many ways, shapes and forms, you know, 18th century systems and organizational structures, right? I think about the physical design, the social design, and the organizational design of the United States Congress. It is just woefully archaic, ill-suited for today. The way we convene, you know, the spaces in which we try to ideate, uh, you know, the, the lack of intention of, of legislative diplomacy, you know, uh, whether it's MPs or members of Congress, you know, working together to confront these threats. My goodness, these are simple, simple challenges to overcome. Uh, but they first have to be overcome domestically, is, is my point. And then to use the very tools that we have invented that are being used against us uh, in a way that uh, uh, is a clear and present opportunity. And I think to your point about um, consolid uh, cooperating on resiliency, democratic resiliency, perhaps within NATO, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. Uh, we have the structure in place. That was my argument, is that you know, I'm, I'm a little bit tired of conversation and reports and convenings uh, that lack any true action. A lot of intention, but not a whole lot of action. And, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm impatient, uh, which I think is not a bad trait in democracy. And I, I, I think it's shared across the political spectrum, and I salute that and hope we can work together towards it. And I should also mention that Dean, you take uh, gray zone assessment bill that I, that I think we all hope mm -hmm. uh, makes, uh, makes it uh, the whole way, because this is, uh, it's a, it has uh, excellent ideas. It's bipartisan and addresses it addresses. It addresses and I have them right dishes. here. I just want to reflect. You know, that I, I've got five gray zone national defense authorization amendments uh, here that I have offered, that all of which have been ruled out of order, despite bipartisan agreement, despite the need, uh, which is my case in point relative to what we must start doing better, which is to remove the politics and employ the principle uh, of what we face and how we can address it. And I, I'll confess, I'm disappointed that some of the most elementary, actionable solutions uh, are not being employed because of, again, a process that is so archaic uh, and uh, lacks expedition. That's something we're all going to face. This is where I think legislators and, and public officials can learn from, from the business world where this sort of uh, inaction yeah. would, would, uh, would not be permissible. Uh, I want to give uh, the opportunity to, to anybody that has a question uh, to ask, to ask it now within the 14 remaining minutes. Um, let's see who wants to go first. Okay, you go first and then you and then you. Thank you. Dr. Merzl Alexander, Institute for Academic Management. Thank you all for a fantastic panel presentation. Um, Dean, if I may, um, I'm so glad that you touched on the 18th century, 19th century principles, because it's part of my research. Yeah. When I look at um, education in this country and the lack thereof of the, uh, the elevation of it, exactly. which brings us to the military. As a Brit, um, hello, John, um, one has to look at Abraham Lincoln and the emancipation, and I think we need another emancipation moment in government where your colleagues can cross the aisle 
and the colleagues on the other side can come together and meet the needs of the nation because it's yeah. not there, clearly. We talk about division, it's at its worst. And I don't think it's just you, I think it's in the UK as well. Yeah. So going across the pond back and forth, one sees that. But my question is, where is the urgency for more military academies in both countries? Because yeah. it's not there. And without military of every ethnic um, background, we wouldn't have had the freedom in this country when it came to the Civil War. So I think there should be an elevation in that regard, and that's something I think that's hugely missing. Interesting. Do you uh, want to have a stab at that, and then uh, I will bring in the, the next two questions. Yeah, do you want to? So I think a little like we, we earlier on we're talking about the comparability with military and civilian um, security. And just I think like with police forces, a military draws its strength from its relationship and its base of support amongst the public that it protects. And just like with any police force, its, um, it's sort of credibility and moral authority is reinforced if it better reflects the population that it protects. And serves. And we've got a long way to go in the UK military. There's been some attempts to recognise that, to change that, um, but it uh, is still the case that the routes into the British military are still heavily, heavily skewed towards the um, traditional type of service personnel, uh, the public school cadet forces, um, that's the private school system in the UK. Um, and um, military colleges, uh, which are very far from reflecting the profile of the of, of the of the British make, British population now. So, um, I think a recognised challenge, but still some very very small steps being taken, and a lot more to do. And I, I want to celebrate your proposition because I recognise that you know the transformation post World War tran two transformation in the United States of America because of soldiers yeah. serving side by side in the foxhole, uh, soldiers of color, soldiers of different races, religions, perspectives, geographies, uh, many for the first time encountering the other. Uh, it changed us in, in, a, in a good way. Uh, so I recognize that. Um, and I think there is an opportunity for more military education. But I would also argue that is, it is the neglect of diplomatic education uh, that we're also struggling with. And, if we are to expand military education, which I think is, a, is an interesting notion, I would argue that we should um, have a corresponding intention to also uh, train more diplomats uh, in this world. And uh, it's easy to come by dollars uh, to build more weapons and to resource militaries. It is increasingly challenging to find the resources to engage in uh, 21st century diplomacy. And I think there is a, uh, that's another opportunity and we don't talk enough about it, which I think is also uh, somewhat analogous to uh, what I call the angertainment industry. You know, we are attracted to fear, right? And therefore, we invest in ways to defend against that fear. We do not invest in diplomacy for the same reason. It's not attractive. It doesn't generate eyeballs because it's soft. It's also the most important missing tool in our respective toolkits, I think, around the world right now, uh, and, it's, um, and it's a problem. And I think that's something we should reflect on. Uh, not to mention, I would argue that in the United States Congress, our Foreign Affairs Committee is, I would argue, that one of the most bipartisan collegial uh, committees in the United States Congress because foreign affairs and diplomacy is generally unifying. You know? uh, so it's something just to, I think something to think about. And uh, I think it's the same opportunity. People of all backgrounds and races, religions, geographies coming together as diplomats is really what the world needs as much. And if I can add, uh, it, it is also the case that the, the UK and, uh, and the US military in particular have had their own unofficial Erasmus programs over mm -hmm. many years because of where they have sent their uh, people in uniform of all ranks to serve. And there is an incredible expertise and experience and exposure to other countries yeah. as a result, as a side benefit to, to, yeah, uh, to these foreign operations. Um, I want to bring you in and then you and then Jim Townsend. 
Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about Ukraine. Um, you, you know, at least in the U.S., we have another. I forgot, um, can you can you identify? Uh, I apologize. Sorry, Brian Harris with Defense News. Um, so, you know, at least in the U.S., we have another aid package coming up. I mm -hmm. want to ask both of you. Um, you know, with it apparently becoming a war of attrition that could take years. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, what the U.S. approach should be going forward. Obviously, we're not going to tell the Ukrainians what victory conditions look like to them. Mm -hmm. But since we are sending, both the U.K. and U.S. are sending substantial amounts of aid, I'm wondering if you think it's sustainable to keep doing that over the long haul. And if not, uh, what needs to be done in order to ensure Ukrainian security guarantees? Mm -hmm. You want to take that, John? Sure. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll... Um, thanks. Was it Ryan or Brian? Brian. Brian. Um, thanks for the question. It, it, it gives me an opportunity, just especially here, just to recognise, to thank and to praise the US leadership on Ukraine. Um, it's been utterly essential, not just for Ukraine, but for the rest of us um, amongst the Western supporters of Ukraine as well. I'm not just thinking about the scale of the military aid, which is topped 40 billion, and I hope your latest um, um, allocation isn't going to get fouled up with the problems at Congress for much longer. Um, but it's also been the it's been the statecraft, it's been the diplomatic work with allies um, that, particularly post Afghanistan, has been so important and so welcoming, uh, so welcome. Um, from a UK point of view. We've, um, we've had absolute UK unity, bipartisanship behind the requirement to stand with Ukraine, confront that Russian aggression. And if there is a change to Labour at the next election next year, there'll be no change to Britain's resolve to continue to do that, including to pursue Putin for his war crimes. Um, so we have to... You, you ask the question, is it sustainable? It has to be sustainable. It has to be sustainable until the point where the Ukrainians can win their fight with Russia. Because um, UK security, and in many ways, um, defence of the UK, defence of the US, starts in Ukraine. If Putin is allowed to um, benefit from those suing for some sort of ceasefire now, if he's allowed to hold on to territory, he's taken by force. He will regroup, uh, he'll consolidate the regime, legitimise some of the methods he uses, and we'll see renewed R Russian aggression in other areas, on other fronts to come. So this is long-term, and I've said to Keir Starmer for well over a year, um, despite the hopes that somehow this would be resolved on the battlefield this year, this will be, uh, Ukraine will be inherited by the next government, whoever wins the next election. So that, that, that is the first thing. The second thing is, I want to be proud of the UK leadership on Ukraine in six months' time, just as I have been over the last 18 months. Uh, and so there are areas where I fear we may be seeing a fall in momentum of UK leadership on Ukraine. Um, and that's a matter for debate in the British Parliament at the moment. But fundamentally, then, how we, how we work with allies to make good the G7 commitments to long-term security arrangements um, out with full NATO membership for Ukraine mm -hmm. is the next medium-term um, medium, medium challenge. And it is not clear to me that that work, that hard work or that leadership is yet taking place. And I have to say, you know, I, I, looking at this through the eyes of Vladimir Putin, you know, United States exits Vietnam, you know, in a debacle. I lost my father in that war, so of course I have very strong personal feelings about that. Uh, turn up the clock to Afghanistan, the United yeah. States vacates in a, in a messy, messy way. Um, almost 10 years ago, uh, he takes Crimea with impunity. You know, are we surprised? You know, are we surprised? This is, these are all, that, that's, that was a gray zone uh, effort, if you will. You know, let's poke and prod and see how much further we can go. And we, they keep going further without, with impunity. He keeps going further. That's why it is imperative that we stay the course, imperative. Uh, you know, and I have to reflect on the fact that, of course, there's an erosion uh, of this support from my GOP colleagues. 
And, and by the way, they're hearing the same thing that many of us are hearing when we go home to our districts, which is how can we be a country that allows people to sleep on our streets, children to go hungry, and yet find $100 billion to send to a country that an overwhelming majority of the country couldn't even find on a map, let alone ever visit. And we say, well, we're defending democracy. And then some of these constituents say, well, you know, I can't afford groceries. You know, who, what are you, who are you really defending? And I, that's the truth, I think, in any democratic nation right now in the world as it relates to continued support uh, of, of, this, of this effort, which is existential, if you ask me, but has to also be matched uh, with, with listening to the needs of our respective um, citizens. And, and that's going to become more complicated, and that's another struggle uh, of democracy. You know, the inability sometimes to walk and chew gum at the same time, to take care of your own while also defending your principles. And um, you know, for a nation, the United States, that spends w what we will be approaching $1 trillion a year on our national defense expenditures, the $100 billion or so that has been allocated to the effort in Ukraine would have built shelter for every American who lacks it right now. These are just the truths. You know, I would argue we can do both and should do both. But it's going to be increasingly difficult to defend democracy when the beneficiaries of democracy don't feel the benefit occurring to them. And I think that is another existential issue that we will have to start reconciling, especially with um, the inequities of, of wealth and income, which in my estimation, again, are usually ultimately lead to the, the downfall of the very democracies that we hope to protect. So, you know, we've got more on our hands than just defending Ukraine. We have to defend democracy at home uh, with more intention as well. And I think that's, um, I think they go hand in hand. And President Zelensky is here um, later this week mm -hmm. to make his appeal. Uh, I don't believe he will be addressing the entire U.S. Congress because it's no longer um, tenable, I think, for Speaker McCarthy to host that type of forum. It's going to be smaller group meetings, which is, um, which is a sign of that erosion uh, of support. It doesn't come from necessarily a bad place, uh, but this is not a um, binary decision. It has to be both. But if we, as um, particularly as elected, uh, the privilege of elected politicians in our countries, aren't prepared to try and offer that leadership, make those arguments, if we can't in uh, encourage and persuade and support our citizens to believe that our, our system our open societies, our open markets, our uh, democracies are worth defending, sure. um, then nobody else will. Yeah, well, we have a crisis of participation, yeah. I think, in both countries and a, and a culture of taking it for granted. Yep. You know, very few Americans <laughs> lived through World War II who are still alive. You know? uh, and that's, that's a real complication because mm -hmm. history will repeat. And democracy can only thrive and survive uh, if people believe in it, people yeah. in, 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 it, uh, in, in the country. So uh, we are out of time, but I, I do want to bring you in, uh, Jim Townsend. So mm -hmm. if we take these two questions yeah, together. No, I've got, I've got and, time. And, and sure. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Laura Kelly with The Hill. Just a quick comment. Um, I recently got back from Ukraine, and it's a great place to visit. I went to the ballet, opera, and went hiking huh. in addition to war reporting. So wow. I encourage people to visit. It's worth defending. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Secretary, how are you preparing for a second Trump presidency that is likely to turn away from allies and partners and that will likely fuel greater partisan divisions in Washington? Can the UK and Europe support Ukraine without the US? Um, and Congressman Phillips, following up on your recent travels, what role does Congress have in moving forward normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Do you expect the administration to come to you to approve some of the demands Saudi Arabia has made related to US defense guarantees, support for its civil nuclear program? And I think there's a third element, but I just forgot it, so sorry. <laughs> uh, and Helps I'll bring in yeah. Jim as well, just so you have more questions to, to memorize. Jim Townsend. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's great to see you both. And thanks to AEI and to Elizabeth for putting this on. Uh, what I want to just say is that a lot of what you've laid out in terms of how we can handle protecting our democracies, in terms of protecting our election system and dealing with the undermining, uh, you talked about having a NATO or US-UK or a NATO center of excellence or something to take this on as a, uh, as a core uh, part of the strategic concept, uh, Minister, as you mentioned. I just wanted to say that right now NATO has this. Uh, it's in Finland. 
it's gotten rave reviews in terms of what it's doing uh, for resilience and has partnered with the European Union. They've got 33 nations that are part of it. I just checked their website a minute ago. A uh, $4 million budget, half of which comes from Finland. Uh, and I know when I was in the government when this, this started that it was getting some rave reviews in terms of how they're coming together to do exactly what you were talking about. It's called the Center of Excellence for Hybrid Warfare. Uh, and it is a joint project, again, with the European Union, which is important because, I mean, it's not just US, UK, but all of us are facing this undermining. So in terms of your idea and, and how we can approach this, something that's actionable, there is a group that's working this, and it might be that you all look at that and see how that would fit into another, another approach or another formation that you might have in mind. Thanks. Thank Jim, I, I can answer that question. So what, uh, what John, well, John can answer it as well, but, but uh, what isn't there is an operational center. The, the Finnish center is a, a, a sort of a, a, an observational center. Uh, but the action has to has to come from somewhere, and that's that's what John is proposing. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hand the, the mic over to you, as it were, for Laura's questions as well. Sure, excellent. Um, you're right; they're doing some great work at that uh, Finnish centre. Um, two things: El Elizabeth's right; it, it, it's more of an observatory, doing some excellent analytical work, um, some collation of best practice. What we're missing is that connection then to um, options for action and operational responses. And that's why my proposal is worked up with Elizabeth is uh, takes a step beyond that. Um, less admiring and um, describing the problem and more trying to drive our systems uh, to the need to, to act and, re and respond. So I think that's what we're looking for. And secondly, I think rooted and located in NATO as an indivisible part of the deterrence and defence um, through NATO, I think it's an important element of the proposal that we're uh, making. It has the potential to become that. And so that's why we're saying root, root it, root it, um, and link it there. Um, on, Lauren's, on Lauren's question, um, this is my first event, uh, having flown in last night, as Elizabeth said. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my meetings, uh, and I'm linking up with our Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lamy, tomorrow as well to do a lot of this together, is bipartisan. Uh, and one of the special strengths of the way that the UK and the US um, have regarded each other and worked together, particularly on defence and security in our militaries, has been that that commitment has withstood the, um, let's say, the political cycles and the changes in political leadership. I don't underestimate the, the challenges that might lie in the sort of scenario that you've talked about. Uh, but we have to be willing and ready to work through that. And um, the, the, the threats that we have to face, the things we have in common, and the deep working links that we've got will allow us, I'm confident, to do that. However, you might have heard me um, say earlier on, what we have to have uh, much more clearly registered, uh, and this is going to require some European rather than US uh, leadership, and I think the UK should be doing this, is a recognition amongst the European nations of NATO that inevitably we're going to have to take on more responsibility within NATO ourselves, as the US uh, has made this enormous commitment to UK and Ukraine. Um, is I hope, and, and trust set to continue its um, fundamental commitment to NATO, but nevertheless has big strategic concerns, obviously, in the Indo-Pacific and in a different area. So that means we will need to do more within NATO as European nations. And as for, Laura, your, your question about uh, the Middle East, uh, I'm very optimistic, having just returned from Israel, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, clearly, we've been, I would argue, distracted by issues in the Indo-Pacific, and um, I think uh, much of the uh, Western world has neglected the Middle East and created a vacuum that is, yeah. would be filled and is being filled by others, at least um, uh, taking steps to do so. Uh, but I'm optimistic, and, I, and, it, and it begins with the recognition of uh, the Saudi vision, which MBS is quite clear. The, the Vision 2030 program, is he's all in on. It, you know, it's, it's 
it, it'll probably be the most extraordinary transformation of a country and culture in human history in, a, in an extraordinarily short period of time that can only be accomplished, if you look at this very objectively, can only be accomplished if uh, they have a defense agreement. You know, they can't, they, this, none of this will work. They will not become a tourist hub. They will certainly not become an economic hub if they don't um, ensure that they have security. And of course, I would argue from a human rights perspective, unless they make modifications relative to some of their uh, human rights protections. So with all that said, I think it's very fertile ground and politically quite ripe. If you look at uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's challenges, if you look at President Biden uh, coming up on an election, I would imagine those two certainly would love to see this uh, get done uh, before next November, uh, which leaves MBS. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a lot of power here uh, relative to leverage. Uh, and it's complicated because civilian nuclear and, and weapons um, uh, uh, programming and defense agreements have implications uh, beyond just Israel and, and the Saudis. I wish Israel and the Saudis would normalize <clears throat> based on the merits of normalization, but clearly this has a lot more to do with the United States. And of course, public reports are civilian nuclear, defense agreements, and then also um, uh, some steps towards solving the Palestinian challenge, uh, which the Saudis have, even in news reports in the last 24 hours, apparently, some indicate they backed off because uh, the Israelis don't seem to want to make any concessions in that area. But I think all three of those will have to be accommodated. I think uh, some steps in those directions would be healthy. I. Growing up uh, in the era in which I grew up, never dreamt of the possibility of a Saudi-Israeli normalization possibility. I give the Trump administration great credit for the Abraham Accords. I think, it was, I think it'll be the hallmark of, of that administration's legacy, uh, one on which we should and must continue to build. If Saudis and Israelis can normalize, my goodness, what is impossible, right? I mean, that's, uh, it, huh? <laughs> and, there, and there will be, I, by the way, we, we, you know, maybe for another day, but a post-Putin Russia is something we should start thinking about. You know, the potential of a failed nation with nuclear weapons. What is next and how do we play a role? How do we play a role in navigating through that? It's not a matter of if, of course, it's just a matter of when. Uh, so I think the future is bright relative to the Middle East. I think, um, you know, the more we can cooperate, just spending, and I want to thank AEI maybe in closing too, just, just for bringing us together. Uh, what I spoke with John about before we walked in was the need for more face-to-face -face between our friends. We do not know one another. We don't create the space and place for us to collaborate. Uh, we have interparliamentary groups that, that occasionally convene, but my goodness, you know, we don't know each other that well. And we have to be more intentional, I think, about bringing our allies together face-to-face -to -face and our adversaries, frankly, because without human relationships, Without human relationships, nothing to which we aspire, I think, will be possible. That's a, uh, an optimistic note to end on. Did you, did you sure. want to uh, add something, John? Uh, uh, so we agree on, on this optimistic uh, conclusion that if uh, the Saudis and the Israelis can reach an agreement, uh, it should be possible to reach agreement uh, between uh, ideological adversaries and indeed uh, between uh, countries that are currently um, uh, daggers drawn. So thank you, Dean. Thank you, John, very you, much, Elizabeth. especially for making time early in the morning uh, after a long flight on United. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for your excellent questions. And uh, Dean and John will have to leave, uh, but feel free to stick around, and I think there even, may even be some coffee left and pastries. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.